Okay, let's talk a little bit about radiation dosimetry in CT. And our objectives for this section, again, relate to discussing just some general terms and basic concepts related to uh, rate CT dosimetry um, in order to examine how radiation dosimetry works for CT. Uh, we're going to be able to uh, make dosage measurements um, for various scanning protocols. And then we'll describe the technical factors as well as the patient factors um, that contribute to uh, radiation dose. So um, basically, as CT technologists, we need to understand both the benefits and the risks of any kind of examination that we're doing. And largely that is to done so that we can minimize the positive minimize the negative and maximize the positive of any diagnostic procedure. Um, that's particularly critical in CT because as she mentions in the chapter, the, some of the doses related to CT are about equivalent to the doses received by people who survived the nuclear, bomb te the nuclear bombs in Japan. Um, so it's a considerable amount of radiation dose and there is a real significant risk of lifetime cancer development um, in certain populations from CT dose. So one of the very first things that we're going to do is make sure that we have an appropriate patient selected for a CT examination. And we've looked at that quite a bit already in this, um, in this course. Um, you've noticed I probably, more than other classes that you are in, I'm often trying to get people out of the CT scan room. You know, I think in a lot of our work, we're trying to get people into our diagnostic exam room. In CT, there's actually a need for technologists who are actively pushing people out of the scan room because there are some people who just do not need to be receiving a CT scan. Um, so what's some examples of people who probably don't need to be getting a CT scan? Pregnant women. Pregnant women. Yep, that would be... Or children. Yep, pediatrics. Other things. So those are good general population definitions, right? Are there certain diagnoses that might not require CT initially? A headache. A headache. Yeah, we sometimes have, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, a lot of times we will still CT for a headache. But, yeah, if they haven't had a chest x-ray and all we're looking for is a cough, let's do the chest x-ray first. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, another thing is rule out appy, especially if it's on a female. We could probably be sending them to ultrasound. We'll look at a little bit more in detail on what are some of those protocols that we probably want to avoid wholesale using. Um, and we'll talk about why people continue to order them. Um, but the big tension for a CTIC technologist is, especially with the old way of doing things, which was filtered back projection, the image quality was directly tied to the CT dose. So I could get you pretty pictures at a really, really high dose, or I could crank the dose down and get you crappy pictures all day long. There was really, it was an either or. And so the question became dose optimization. How do I get you the best possible pictures at the lowest possible dose? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how that has changed, but for right now, let's just get some basic terminology. The unit of x-ray exposure in air is the Rankine, right? There is another unit of x-ray exposure in air more common to the SI system. Does anyone know what it is offhand? Gray. 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 So, you could gray, so you could say gray in air. That would be exposure in air. Also, coulombs per kilogram, that's actually what like a Geiger counter or an ion chamber is measuring is it's measuring the amount of energy produced in a certain volume of air. Um, but for our purposes here today, we can, it's sufficient to, say, to use the Rankine for that. Um, for absorbed dose, she indicates the radiation absorbed dose. And this, she indicates as the gray. So this would be gray in tissue. A lot of times it's expressed in milligray. In the CT dose range, we're dealing with milligray. Um, so the conversion factors from the traditional to the SI units, um, is 100 rad equals 1 gray, 1 rad equals 1 centigrade. Um, most of where CT is at now deals with the SI units. Yeah, bless you. 
Um, quality factor, this is one part of the chapter that she kind of, I think, makes more muddy than it needs to be. Um, let me double check one thing here. Yeah. Um, it seems to me when she's talking about quality factor, she's actually referring to something that derives from uh, a relative biologic effect, or RBE. Um, so when she's talking about quality factor, she's really talking about the radiation weighting factor. Um, so what am I talking about? Uh, there are different ways to calculate dose. For example, if you were to ask your medical physicist at your hospital, what was the patient dose from that CT head scan, they will look at you like you're crazy. Um, because there is really, really no way to accurately um, say what the dose is to an entire volume as big as the head, right? And that's not that big of a volume. Um, what they can perhaps calculate is the dose to a specific organ within the body. So they could, they could come in the ballpark range of what they would expect the dose to be, for example, to this section of the brain. Um, but they do not think in the same terms that we do about dose. Um, but this is, let me hit pause here for just a sec. Perhaps the, the easiest way for us to talk about it and be using the same language that the, the medical physicists are using is to talk about an effective dose, okay? Um, and so the way I think about an effective dose is how the dose affects the patient, specifically whatever organ of the body we're talking about, right? So using our brain example, we're going to need to know a number of things. We're going to need to know that um, exposure amount in air. So we're going to need to know that amount of gray, right? Or in CT example, milligray. And we're going to multiply that by two weighting factors. One of them is a weighting factor for the radiation. And that's what I think she's trying to talk about when she talks about quality factor. I talk about it as a weighting factor... W sub R, right? The weighting factor for that radiation. The weighting factor for diagnostic radiation is 1. So it's almost a null thing here. But the weighting factor, for example, for nuclear isotopes, for an alpha particle, is 20. Right? So what this is trying to say is, what is the dose equivalent, right, between CT and a nuke med study, for example. How do those doses weight, and how, do they, how does that weight differ? Then we're going to need to further multiply it by a weighting factor for the tissue. A weighting factor for the tissue that was exposed to the radiation. And this will give us an effective dose. Sometimes it's written E, small f, big D, and it's going to be expressed in sieverts. So an effective dose attempts to account for the effects particular to a patient's tissue when they've absorbed a specific weight of radiation dose. Okay. Now we need to talk a little bit about geometry in CT because the CT um, tube is turning around the patient. And so the dose profile is going to be different from CT than for conventional x-ray. In fact, it will be more similar to the dose profile in radiation therapy where they're doing a series of treatments from different angles. Okay? So we're going to spread that dose out quite a bit. And she has a good illustration of it on page uh, 66 and 67 in our textbook. We can see that the... Um, Body scans are less uniform in dose profiles than head scans. Um, because the head has a fairly uniform density, and it's also more or less circular in shape, um, we are going to see more or less equivalent amounts of dose across the surface of the skull, as well as a very similar dose at the center of the head. And, I mean, honestly, if we're thinking about this from a radiation therapy standpoint, this makes sense, too, because a lot of times we do whole brain treatments with just two lateral um, treatments. 
So the dose profile is more or less uniform in radiation therapy as well, just generally speaking. Body scans are going to be less uniform because the body is essentially elliptical in shape if you're looking at it in a transaxial plane. And so the central dose of a body scan will probably be about one-third of what it is at the skin. Okay? So um, one of the real difficulties with this is that organ doses are going to be higher for pediatric patients than they are for adults. Because adults, basically, I've got all this shielding around, for example, my liver that's just other tissues in my body. Right? So the body is able to internally shield from the radiation that's coming in peripherally as the CT scan spins around the patient. So these are largely the, this is as the dose geometry affects the X and Y um, coordinates in our CT system. Let's talk a little bit about what happens with the Z axis. Along that Z axis we have some weird stuff that happens. Um, so the radiation is going to tail from one slice to the neighboring slices. Okay, That tailing effect is going to be less significant if we're, lose, if we're using a larger pitch. right? As we reduce the pitch less than 1, like if we've got a pitch of 0.5, that tailing effect is actually going to be enhanced. That tailing effect will be enhanced. What am I talking about? Um, Again, this is on page 167 in our textbook. But say I've got these um, 10 millimeter slices here, right? Um, as the scanner scans through this slice, it's going to tail from one slice to the next. So you can see there's bleed over in these areas right here and right here and right here. Um, one of the ways that may be helpful to think about this, if you're coming from the nuke med world, is um, edge packing, right? That at the edges of your receptor, I believe, there is an intensification of uh, sensitivity to radiation, right? Um, similar thing happening for the CT scanner and within the patient dose profile. As we have these slices, there is an increased dose because from slice to slice, there's some scatter radiation that's moving from one slice to the other. So this is, again, along the z-axis. And along the z-axis, we're going to have these radiation tails from one neighboring slice to another. So this is why we use a, what we drive towards is a CTDI volumetric. Okay, and we'll talk about what that means, but before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the MSAD. Um, this is called a multiple scan average dose, right? So it's taking into account the fact that there is this tailing effect along the z-axis from one slice to another, and it's going to be calculated over a series of multiple scans. So when the physicists come in to do this every year, they have a uniform phantom that they insert a pencil ion chamber into the phantom, they scan the phantom repeatedly, and they come up with an MSAD over those multiple scans, what is kind of the volume, volumetric dose that resulted from that. Now once we have an MSAD, we can calculate a computed tomography dose index, a CTDI, right, a CTDI. And the machine will actually tell us what the CTDI, it's required by law now, um, effective January of this last year, and it's going to be fully put into effect January 2017, that all CT scanners, if people want Medicare reimbursements, they must be able to calculate and report a CTDI in a DLP in a way that's PACS formatted, that can be sent to PACS. They want to start documenting this, right? Um, so this, when it's produced, when a CT manufacturer produces a CT scanner, they will report its CTDI for head and for body phantoms to the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration will oversee this. Um, the slices must be contiguous. What does that mean? They need to have a pitch of one. When we're calculating a CTDI initially, um, if we're talking about this MSAD value, it has a pitch of one the initial CTDI that we will come up with will have a pitch of 1. Okay, This is working s completely just off of phantoms, right? 
I'm not talking about with patients. I'm talking about experimental work done on CTQC phantoms. Then we can come up with a CTDI subscript W, a CTDIW. This is a weighted average, right? This is a weighted average. Um, so what is the average CTDI for this scan protocol? With this pitch, with this um, slice thickness, with this MA profile. Once we have that CTDIW, if we divide it by the pitch, we can give you a CTDI volumetric. So as you can imagine, if I had a pitch of 0.5, that's going to double my CTDI. If my CTDI was 10 at a pitch of 1, if I divide 10 by 0.5, I will have 20. So pitch increases the CTDI volumetric. As the pitch decreases, CTDI volumetric increases. As the pitch decreases, the volumetric is going to, uh, as the pitch increases, the volumetric will decrease. So this will account for all the exposure variations along the z-axis, um, and it is independent of the scan length, right? It's just slice by slice, this is what we would expect to see throughout the scan volume. This is what we typically use, is the CTDI volumetric. All these other numbers and terms relate to it, though. Finally, from that, we can calculate a dose length product. The machine will do it for us, um, but it accounts for the length of the scan. So it's basically the CTDI volumetric uh, multiplied by the length of the scan. So the CTDI is going to be the smaller number, and the DLP will be a bigger number. So, radiation doses from CT exams are a lot bigger than those from uh, radiography, and they're a lot bigger for, than most um, nuclear medicine studies, too. In the book, she indicates that, like, for example, sometimes this is what I use quite a bit with, with CT patients as I'm explaining to them. I'll say, okay, chest x-ray, let's say it's like 10 days in the sun, right? That's about the na same natural background radiation. To, or you could say a chest x-ray, it's like a flight to Paris, right? It's like a flight to Paris in terms of natural background radiation. A CT scan is like 100 chest x-rays, so it's like 100 flights to Paris, right? It's about the same amount of radiation. That's the best way to explain it to the patient. But um, that price, that higher dose price, is what we have to pay to get these amazing pictures, basically. Um, now, we're starting to push back on that some, but this is kind of the reasoning. So, um, one thing that can be significant, though, is um, the surface dose from a CT scan can be about 10 times higher than for conventional radiography. The internal dose might be up to upwards of 100 times, right? So, that's what I'm talking about in that comparison. So, let's, here's the actual numbers. And you, these, some of these numbers are worth memorizing right now, I can tell you that. Um, the average background radiation for Americans is 3 millisieverts annually. 3 millisieverts annually is what we receive from natural background radiation. The exposure from a chest x-ray is about 0.1 millisieverts. From a chest, abdomen, pe or pelvis CT, it's about 10 millisieverts. Right? So here's again that 100 times... Right, and you can see it's a little over three times that of natural background radiation. So here are the factors that control that affect the patient dose. Some of these we have some control over. Some of them are very much determined by the protocol. Okay, the radiation beam geometry, specifically whether the rotation arc of the CT scan is 180 degrees, 360, or if there's an overscan, like with a fourth generation scanner of like 400 degrees or something, that additional arc is going to cause an additional dose. Filtration. CT uses a great deal of filtration, so the beam is significantly harder than conventional uh, radiography. 
Um, and so that does have an effect on the dose, but that's actually a good thing. We want the beam to be harder. Um, detector efficiency, most of the solid state detectors that we're using are anywhere from about 80 to 100 percent efficient in the way that they detect the x-rays that are incoming. So as we increase detector efficiency, we'll be able to decrease patient dose. Um, slice width and spacing for the factors we've already talked about. As we have thinner slices, we will increase the number of tails that occur from slice to slice because there's simply more slices, right? And so as we decrease slice width, we will be increasing patient dose. Likewise, as we decrease the spacing between the slices, we will be increasing patient dose. That is how pitch falls in there. So as I decrease pitch, I will be increasing patient dose. As I increase pitch, I would be decreasing patient dose. And then the scan field diameter plays a part. This is not the display field diameter. This is the actual scan field diameter. So as I change the display field diameter, all I'm doing is improving spatial resolution. I'm just affecting spatial resolution of the pixels that I'm computing. The scan field diameter, so a lot of times we have very little control over. It's a hard set thing in, this, in the machine, and we don't mess with it a lot, right? But the scan field diameter will affect um, the dose. As the scan field gets bigger, we're exposing a bigger area, we're going to have an increased dose. So we do have some control over radiologic technique. With CT, we don't have a lot of control over the KVP. We'll just do a KVP of 120 or 140. Um, but for mass, we do have some control. A lot of times we give it to the automatic tube current modulation, right? So we will set a range, and it will modulate between those ranges as it needs more dose to see what it needs to see, or less dose, for example. One thing that we do not have a control over is the patient's size, right? or the part thickness, or even just the density of that part. Um, she mentions repeat scanning, um, but another way to think about uh, repeat scanning, um, let me see if she has this anywhere else. Just to see. Yeah, She doesn't mention it here, but in addition to repeat scanning, I would also add extra images, right? Extra images. We, we think about this a lot. For example, in x-ray, like, oh, man, i got to go, go back and repeat this chest x-ray, right? Um, in CT, they inadvertently do this all day long. Because, for example, the scanning protocol says to scan to the pubic symphysis, for example. A CT of the abdomen and pelvis, it says scan from diaphragm to the pubic symphysis. Well, Let's say the tech didn't read that protocol really closely, and I'm, I'm guilty of this just as much as anyone else, and they scan through the pubic symphysis, right? Through the ischial tuberosities. Now I have an additional maybe two to three to four centimeters of distance that I've covered with the CT scanner. It's not required. The protocol specifically says to the pubic symphysis, I could limit the patient's scan range to just that volume, and I'm fine. I've satisfied what the doctors want. But a lot of times what CT techs will do, and I'm, again, I'm guilty of this too, is include an additional area of coverage because it's kind of a CYA kind of thing, right? If you, but bear in mind, every time you do that, you are significantly increasing the patient's dose. Like every additional amount that you scan is equivalent to basically hundreds of x-rays, hundreds of chest x-rays, right? So in terms of limiting patient dose in a very practical way and also in a more economical way, in educating our CT techs on what specifically they need to be scanning and limiting scan ranges to just that area will significantly decrease patient dose and also improve uh, the financial efficiency of the department. Finally, collimation. We do have a little bit of control over collimation, but um, largely the scanner determines that. So what's the big deal? Why am I talking so much about CT dose? Um, the, even though CT scanners, even though CT scan exams, for example, one study that she cites says CT scans are like 11% of all the diagnostic exams that we do every year in the United States of America. They're just like 10% 
of the diagnostic exams that we do, they contribute to 60%, over 60% of the patient dose. So they're 10% of the scanning that we do, they're 60% of the patient dose, right? Um, there is new information coming out every month that raises all sorts of red flags about the relationships of the dose amounts that we get from a CT scan and the potential for cancer generation, right? For example, I saw some research very recently that said, so we mentioned earlier, I said the CT, the CT dose for chest, abdomen, pelvis, 10 millisieverts. At the range of 7.5 millisieverts, we are now able to see, with a new kind of microscope, we can see double-strand DNA breaks. Why? Are, who cares about double-strand DNA breaks? Double-strand DNA breaks can lead to cancer. Basically, they can either kill the cell outright, or the cell can become mutated such that it, becomes other mutated, it generates other mutated cells that could either have a direct somatic effect on that individual to where they, they eventually develop cancer, or it could have generational effects if it affects a germ cell, right? So we do not know the long-term stuff that the CT stuff may be doing, but it is starting to raise some red flags. Um, so there is a real need for education. For example, when I got into this field, Someone just walked up to me one day and said, hey, you want to be a CT tech? And I was like, sure. And they're like, you just lay the patient on the table and you're done. That was literally my education in how to be a CT tech, right? Everything else, all this other junk that I've been spewing at you this entire semester is stuff I've had to self-educate myself on, right? I did not ever sit in a classroom and someone tell me all this junk and me figure out, oh, that's the important thing. I sat down with the board outline and said, okay, this is what the ARRT says I need to know. And then I read a bunch of research, read a bunch of textbooks, saw it out there in the field, and realized, okay, this is what's important, this is not so much, right? It's an evolving field, and a lot of times when you have an evolving technology, education is the last thing that anyone's thinking about. They're just thinking, get people out there who can do this, and then we'll teach them how to do it later on, right? Um, so there's a very neat, real need for education. This is an area that needs more research, too. Um, so, uh, he, she mentions inappropriate scanning parameters have, this is a beautiful understatement, inappropriate scanning parameters have been found in some facilities. I would say inappropriate scanning uh, parameters have been found in pretty much every facility I've ever worked in, period. And if they've been in every facility I've ever worked in, I've worked in three different states, I would say they're probably pretty much everywhere you go. Um, that there are ways, because of the lack of education, that we are inappropriately scanning our patients at any given facility. Now, um, kudos to the American College of Radiology for identifying this and trying to come up with some standardized way of reporting CT dose. So we now have a database. The largest CT database in the world is run by the American College of Radiology for over 400 different facilities, the last time I checked it was like 442 facilities, are reporting their CT doses to this database so that we can get some kind of consensus on what, for example, should be the protocol for a CT admin pelvis, right? But this is like close to 50 years after the first development of CT scanning that we finally have realized, okay, we need to be using computers to look at the material, to look at the doses that this thing is producing, right? Anything prior to 2008, we have no clue what, what long-term we're talking about. So, in addition to that, it speaks to the lack of awareness among patients, clinicians, and even radiologists. There are even some radiologists who you will be talking to who are accustomed, they just sit there and look at boob pictures all day long, right? They just sit there and read mammo pictures all day long. They have no clue what you're talking about when you come and start saying about, hey, should I be doing the CT scan on this 14-year-old female? Um, why are, she hasn't had an ultrasound. They haven't, done, they haven't done an HCG. Sure, scan them, right? They're... That, at that point, there's now my turn to put on my little teacher hat and explain to them, well, this is why I'm coming to you with this concern, is there's a significant dose here, um, and blah, 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 you know. Um, that, that stuff is important, to be able to back up what you're saying in CT. So, um, it is our job 
as technologists in any of the fields that we're in, including radiation therapy, to give our patients and our physicians an appropriate perspective on the risks related to ionizing radiation. It is our job. Like the buck stops here, right? If there's ever a question about like what I'm worried about what the CT scans done. I'm gonna I read this Reader's Digest article and I I had these questions. I saw this thing online and WebMD says this. You have to be you have to be able to answer all those questions. That is your job. That is solidly within your job description. Right? It is you are basically an educator. So I want to make sure that I'm educating you appropriately in this stuff. Now something to understand about people's perceptions of risk, right? People are weird when it comes to risk. For example, we are more worried about dying in a plane crash than getting into our car and dying in a car accident, even though it is far more risky to get into a car, right? We have, we have risk perceptions related to the unknown. For example, I don't know how x-rays work. I'm going to be more scared of the x-rays that I'm getting today than the Lysol that I keep on my kitchen counter for my five-year-old to swallow, right? That's just how people think. We, we, we tend to be, if we can't control it and we don't understand it, we're more scared of it, right? I can't control x-rays. They do weird things like scatter. Um, they are difficult to explain to patients. Therefore, they are scared of them. They have an unnatural perception of the risk, right? So it is our job to be able to scientifically with them, in terms that they can understand, educate them on both the benefits and the risks of this stuff, okay? Recognize, in a nutshell, that the people that you talk to every single day do not have all the education and background that you have and bring it down to a level that they can understand. Don't, don't talk to them like they're stupid, right? But bring it to a level that they are like, okay, I get that. I get that. So, risk-benefit is the number one way that we talk about this, right? Um, if the individual is aware of the risk, right? This is especially difficult with pediatric patients. CT, for example, can double your risk as a pediatric patient for developing cancer. It can double your risk as a pediatric patient for developing cancer. But your initial risk for developing cancer was 1 in 1,000. So what does that mean? It went up to 2 in 1,000, right? So it is a doubling. It's a significant raise in the risk, but it is still a small risk, right? It is still a small risk. People have a very difficult time understanding that. It is a significant raise in the risk, but it is still a small risk. Um, they need to understand they are receiving a benefit from this. I, we are going to be able to find out whether, you, whether or not you have appendicitis. I know that doesn't sound really scary, but during the Civil War, you died of appendicitis, right? Like, people died of this kind of stuff. I mean, not that long ago, people never knew this person was having a stroke, right? Right? 1970s, 1980s, we have no clue what's going on with this person. All of a sudden, they can't talk. The left side of their face is drooping. We do not know what's going on here, right? We won't know until there's an autopsy. CT has answered a lot of questions, so make sure that they understand. You're in this with me. I'm going to tell you there is a real risk. It is a small risk. Here's the benefit. We can find out, are you going to die today? Right? <laughs> That's maybe not quite the best way to frame it, but it does help. I have used that with drunks. Um, <laughs> hey, everything reasonable has been done to reduce the risk. And this is another thing that sits solidly in my corner. Have I discussed all this with the doctors who are ordering it? Have I done everything reasonable with my scanning parameters? Have I limited it, my, my scan parameters to just the area of interest? Have I done everything that I can to keep this dose Alara? Now let's talk about pediatric stuff. So when we talk to pediatric folks and their, patient, and their parents, we need to tell them there is a, um, a small risk involved. There is a small risk involved. 
CT does in, in, increase your risk of getting cancer. It does. Like it's been proved. Um, so we are going to restrict this procedure to just the people who need it, right? There's a lot of helicopter parents out there who, when Junior falls off of the table, they immediately rush him to Le Bonner for a CT scanner. You know, Susie's got a cough. Let's go to Le Bonner. I'm going to demand a CT scan, right? Um, it is our job to explain to those people, look, this is, there may be other tests that are just as good at telling us whether or not this is going on. So what are your real concerns today? Um, let's make sure that we're getting the best test possible for that. Um, and this is a particularly sticky wicket, right, because this is where a lot of lawsuits come from, right? Well, they didn't do the CT scan, so, you know, we never knew. Right, I had a doctor I worked with in Utah. We CT'd everything. Everything that walked through the door with Dr. B's name on it got a CT scan because she had been in a lawsuit because the one person who came in with a headache who didn't get a CT scan was really having a stroke. Right? So after that, we CT'd everything. Um, so... We want to, finally, um, if we need to do this test, we are going to make every effort possible to keep that dose down with using the factors that we talked about. The problem with kids, right, is they have an increased sensitivity. They have, still have lots of rapidly dividing cells, right, which are, have an increased sensitivity to radiation. Um, so we're going to have a higher effective dose, right? The potential of this dose to impact this child is going to be increased because there's a different tissue weighting factor for them, right? And we're seeing it more. We're seeing it a lot more. Um, these are the reasons why we have to think seriously about the kids. Let's talk about the fetus. Um, she mentions that the dose is of most concern from zero to three months. So this is why every woman, basically, um, who walks through the CT scan doors should have some kind of test or something explaining to me whether or not they're pregnant or they should be able to very accurately report and I can very quickly calculate whether or not we should be doing a CT scan. Um, if we're talking about someone in the first trimester, there's got to be a significant reason why we're doing a CT scan. Um, and uh, because, in all seriousness, even though the physicists are kind of saying now, we can probably scan a woman for appendicitis with an appropriate dose profile and not cause any problems to the fetus, if you're talking about in that first trimester, not only are you talking about potential of increasing cancer in a really real way, like not just when the kid's 50, but when the kid's like 6 or 7, you're also talking about affecting their brain, like um, causing some kind of uh, neurological disorder. So if I seem kind of heavy on some of this stuff, it's because I've seen it out there, I've seen... I have seen a CT scan of a pregnant woman. Like, um, I've, seen, uh, I've seen doctors order them. I've had to do them. Um, I have seen w women come in and try to induce an abortion by getting a CT scan. So you will see every possible level of education, every possible level of usage of this, this technology, and you need to be prepared for some pretty wackadoodle stuff, right? And... Uh, and have, an, a, when the time comes for an answer, can we do this? Is this safe? Yes, we can do this. Or no, we need to think about something else. So, for reducing the dose, we will try to adjust the mass to that specific patient size and dose profile. So there's even been some studies done recommending like using a BMI or something like that for adjusting the dose, and I think that that will develop some more in the future. When available, we'll use automatic tube current modulation. That's pretty much universally available now. So as you're out in the field, as you're watching CT techs doing what they're doing, 
they will probably not be messing with it too much, but just ask them where is like the smart MA or where is, I'll give you all the names of some of these different uh, vendors for, for, CT, for GE, which is most of what y'all see, it's called smart MA. Um, avoid increasing the KVP. KVP, like we talked about in diagnostic x-ray, can help us reduce patient dose. In CT, it increases patient dose. Um, increase the pitch. If we can, a little bit will help us reduce the dose because we're reducing the area of tailing, right? Um, and limit the use of thin slices except for where it's really, really needed. We can always do thinner reconstructions than what we acquired the slices at. We will limit repeat scans as much as possible. Um, and this is, again, one of the reasons why we're starting to report CTDI to PACS and also to the EMR is we're interested in how many CT scans has this frequent flyer had. Like, you, there's always those patients who come in, they're drug-seeking, they, uh, they always have chronic lower back pain or something like that, hip pain, and we do CT scan after CT scan after CT scan after them because uh, the doctors, again, are covering their butts before they prescribe an opiate or whatever they prescribe to this patient, right? Um, eventually that has its toll um, and we're starting to try to limit that. Uh, we will use iterative construction methods because what iterative construction does specifically to dose is it allows us to have higher quality images at a lower dose. So it untethers the dose from the image quality. So I talked about with filter back projection, if I want prettier pictures I've got to increase my dose. right? Iterative construction allows me to have better pictures at a decreased dose, right? That's basically what it does. Um, and most, again, most of the facilities here in the, in the area are starting to use that. Um, we'll customize the CT scan as much as possible. We will shield the patient, too. Now, one thing that she indicates in the textbook, I want to show you something that's a no-no. On page 177, this should have a big X over it the image of the topogram, tomogram with the patient who has a shield on them, don't do that. Don't do that. Especially if you're using any kind of automatic tube current modulation or an iterative reconstruction, because what it does is the CT scanner is, is creating a dose profile for what it sees on that topogram image, right? So if it sees more density on that tomogram image, it's going to bump up the dose. All those areas that are shielded, the CT scanner's thinking, oh, I'm going to get through that. So what you do is you keep the shielding off when you're doing the scout images. Keep the shielding off when you're doing the scout images so that as it's constructing a dose profile, it's not bringing the shielding into a as a factor. Before I do my actual scan, I'm going to come in there and throw the shielding on and scan them. All right, that's it for the lecture.